Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Walsh from Feather and Fur Animal Hospital, and I'm here with the Hawaiian Feathered Friends Network, uh, talking about all sorts of bird stuff. So, well, hello everybody. For uh, those of you who don't know, I am uh, Dr. Brian Walsh. I'm the, uh, the president of Feather and Fur Animal Hospital. Uh, we're one of the bigger hospitals that see uh, a lot of birds, as well as dogs, cats, and other exotic uh, pets. Uh, we also do some work with um, the um, the wildlife Depart you know, the Department of Wildlife and Sea Life Park when they have birds and stuff that have issues as well. So um, I guess I was got short notice. Otherwise, I'd try and make a little more time for these kind of presentations. But I got short notice that you guys were concerned about citizen beak and feather disease and was asked to come and talk to you guys about that. So, um, so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to go over it. And then I'll have a little bit of time for some questions. But like I said, I can't stay as, as long as I usually can at these things. So, citizen beak and feather disease, like the name implies, it's a disease that affects citizens, which for those of you that aren't super used to bird talk, that's the technical name for parrots. So it affects the parrot species. Um, and then, as you would guess, it affects the beak, it affects the feathers, but it also affects the immune system, which is um, the main part of what actually kills the birds, unfortunately. Uh, it's a natural virus found in Australia. Uh, and there's a large number of uh, Australian birds that will just test positive for it and be living with it and not actually being affected by the disease. Um, the disease affects the fast-growing cells. So in birds, the fast-growing cells are their feather cells, their beak cells, and also in their bone marrow, their white blood cells. And so as it attacks those cells, it will start to cause the beak and feather disorders, and then it'll start to attack the bone marrow, which suppresses the immune system, and then the birds typically die from secondary infections from bacteria and funguses. Um, so who's most at risk? So the disease only affects parrot species, so most of Hawaii's wild birds are not carriers. They can't carry it. Um, the only ones that could theoretically would be there are a few groups of wild parrots that are living, but most of the other birds obviously uh, would not be able to. Um, additionally, there's a classification made by, by biologists between old world parrots and new world parrots. What that means is new world animals are essentially from North and South America. Old world animals are from uh, everywhere else, so Europe, Africa, Australia, Asia. Um, I actually don't know how they classify the Antarctica guys, um, but um, for the sake of this presentation, the, the New World birds are actually pretty resistant to the disease. So, you know, the, the Amazons, the macaws, these guys aren't as at risk for it. Um, certain other birds are at a much higher. So the ones um, are that we see, you know, Conyers, macaws, Amazons are all pretty good for it. Uh, but then the ones we see the most are cockatoos, African greys, lovebirds, lorries, lorikeets, eclectus parrots, and budgies mainly are the ones we see the most in the U.S. affected with it. Here in Hawaii, the ones we see the most with it are lovebirds, which I think a lot of you are already aware of. The lovebirds are the ones we see that get it the most. Um, and in Australia, they've tested groups and found almost 100% of certain wild flocks test positive for the virus. So not every bird that is... Um, you know, that, that has it is necessarily going to uh, show, become infected with the disease in terms of it affecting them. So there are carriers out there. Um, another big factor in terms of at risk is age. So it, it really affects the youngest birds the most. That's because their immune system is still developing and still weak when they're really young. So birds under a year old are the most at risk. Um, and then, um, and then if your bird is immunosuppressed for some reason, he's got other infections going on, other diseases fighting, he's fighting, you know, then that bird would be at risk too. So, so now how does your bird get it, the transmission? And this is kind of the scarier part because essentially the birds will shed it in the feather dander and um, in the aerosolized feces and even from aerosolized secretions. Most of it though is coming from the skin and feather dander. The little virus fomites that are in there, those particles are really stable in the environment and they can live. Um, I was actually unable to find a definitive answer on how many months they can live, but they can live for months in the environment. Uh, and so that's, I think, what kind of scares people is because it's, it's, and the other part is it's actually not that easy to kill just with disinfecting. So it's pretty hardy um, as well. And so that's the scariest component of it. But to get any disease, there's something that you have to understand. There's basically two factors that are at work. 
One is how much of the infectious agent you're exposed to, and the other is how strong your immune system is. And that holds true for any type of infection, whether it's bacterial, fungal, viral, or parasitic, or any of them. Uh, we're exposed to low levels of infectious organisms all the time, and we don't just automatically get sick all the time because generally our immune system's functioning and can fight it off. So that still holds true for this disease as well. So you have to be exposed to a fair amount of it and be a susceptible bird to be one that's going to get it. So that would be, yeah, I know like a lot of people worry, like, could someone get it by taking their bird out in the public? And, you know, most transmission actually is from bird to bird. Like the birds are literally like right next to each other. They're living together. They're in the same room, same air space for a prolonged time. Those are the ones typically that get it. So if someone say had a bird that they had at home and they go out and they're walking through the area and they walk by your bird, your bird's not going to really be at any significant risk for the disease. Um, if that person was like super cuddling their bird and had a whole bunch of the dander on their shirt and then went and grabbed your young immunocompromised bird and like called it up and shoved it up against her shirt, theoretically you could get it that way. So it, it can travel like that, but just the odds of it going in indirect contact, it's, it's really unlikely. Um, so hopefully that can alleviate some of your fears about the transmission from it. Um, the, um, what else do I want to tell you about that? Yeah, so I, that was the main part kind of on that. Uh, and then just kind of how the disease progresses in birds. So it, it varies from bird to bird on, on, how, on how they become affected. So some birds will actually be exposed to the virus and clear the virus and never get sick from it. And that's ideally the best case. And the birds that are likely to um, clear it obviously are the older ones, the ones with the strong immune systems, and clearly the species that aren't typically affected generally uh, clear it without ever having an issue. Um, some of the young birds though, the, especially the ones under six months, they can rapidly die from the disease. So they don't necessarily show all the typical like beak and feather signs that you think of, but they just get really sick and go downhill really fast. Um, and there's unfortunately no matter when they get at what age, if they start to get sick from it, eventually, unfortunately, they always, always die. Uh, and so that's the other scary part of the disease is there's no actual cure once they start to show signs from it. Um, it means they're going to pass away at some point. The more common one that we think of, though, isn't that acute form that kills the young guys quickly. It's the one that causes the actual beak and feather disease that you actually see. And so in those guys, um, you'll start to see things like the, the feathers start to come out abnormally. Uh, the birds that have a lot of the powdery down, the, the powder will actually stop being, uh, will get attacked and that actually stops being produced so they lose all their powder. And then those birds, if you look at their beaks, they kind of have like, um, you know, kind of that more matted color to them. They're not a bright shiny color because they generally have the powder kind of that they're getting on themselves. When they get that disease and they don't have the powder anymore, then that beak actually will become black and shiny for a while. So um, you actually can see a shiny beak initially from it. But then as the disease progresses, the beak will then also become affected, sometimes directly from the virus getting into the beak cells and destroying it. But also um, they get lots of bacterial and fungal infections into the beak itself. And so that will also cause an abnormal beak um, as well. So birds, the other, the other thing that we, one of the most common reasons for a bird to come into our hospital, besides the general sickness, is feather picking. And everyone knows a feather picking bird. In fact, I can see several right now. Um, generally, just feather picking isn't really a sign of beak and feather disease. So just because you have a bird that's showing like feather loss, that doesn't mean beak and feather disease. It's actually like abnormally formed feathers that are coming out. So. Um, it's not just the regular feathers and the guys yanking them. You see stunted feathers, abnormal feathers. Um, and then the beak will start to get different types of lesions, like the beak will get these sores in it and crustiness and, and break down. Um, you know, and so it's, it's when we see those kind of signs, those are when we obviously are, are most concerned about it. When they do show those signs, you can manage some of the secondary infections you get with antibiotics and, and antifungal medications. And I know a number of birds that have been showing signs and getting sick off and on for, for years, and we've been able to keep them going for a while with, you know, aggressive antibiotics and antifungal medications. But after anywhere from, you know, months to three years, the, if they're showing signs, unfortunately, they're going to pass away at some point. Um, and then um, 
And then, like I said, you can also have birds that don't show any signs that kind of can, can shed it. And those are generally like the, the ones you worry about that would be the, the lovebirds. Those aren't super common uh, here, but that, that can happen. Uh, and so for decontaminating the areas on the, to the next section, for decontaminating areas that have had it, that's a more difficult procedure because it is a really hardy virus. So if there's a suspected case that comes through one of the hospitals, basically we mul bleach multiple times everything that can be bleached and discard everything that can't be. And uh, we'll do that for several days and not let birds into that room for several days. Uh, if it's actually a house where the guy's been living and you want to like move your bird into it, you know, I would be throw anything away that can be thrown away, scrub everything with bleach that can be scrubbed. And I would do that on a regular basis and I wouldn't bring a bird in there for months, unfortunately. So if you've got a bird that's been, you know, a positive um, beacon feather bird that's been shedding the virus in the environment, um, it, I, it would be a while before I'd want a bird in there. Um, and then for prevention, which is like, what I'm sure all of you want to know the most, it's, it's, um, it's not that easy other than there's no, vi there's no vaccine. So basically it's really try and limit exposure, you know? And so when you want to play with other birds and stuff like that, generally you want to know um, a little bit about the history of the birds. You want to know that they're doing okay. Um, there is a test for it. There's what are called the PCR tests, which look for circulating DNA and shedding DNA from the virus. And so we can run those by drawing blood and swabbing the bird and swabbing the feces and sending that off to a lab and they, and they can screen for that. Um, and then, um, you know, if you have really young birds, really immunocompromised birds, those birds really shouldn't be going out and seeing everybody anyway. Those guys should be staying home and, 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 and being taken care of. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a, like a, a great answer of if you do this, you'll, you'll never, you know, never get it other than just avoid it, you know, as best you can. So um, I know that may have created some new fears. It may have answered some questions, but that's kind of the quick overview um, of the disease. So who's got some questions? Yeah. If somebody is um, knowingly or, or comes to find out that they're a breeder and they are the ones, they're ground zero, mm -hmm. what can be done short of having government actually come in and confiscate and kill our birds? Well, the, the problem is there's not even, it's not a disease that has any effect to people or any effect to food production or anything like that. So the government um, actually doesn't care. So the, um, the only thing that can be done is that individual person has to, on their own cognizance, decide to um, se essentially like separate out his, con his exposed population and not use them for breeding and selling and that kind of stuff. Um, and so there's not an easy, uh, you can, if, you, if you know who it is, you can boycott their birds, but that only does so much um, as well. So unfortunately that's, uh, breeders that aren't clearing it out and then uh, pet stores that aren't doing a good job of screening and testing are kind of the two most common sources um, of, um, of people ending up with those kind of birds. Oh yeah, so essentially bleach actually doesn't officially kill the, the virus fomites, but what they, Colorado State did a study where they did one to ten, one part bleach to ten parts water and scrubbed their surfaces with that several times a day uh, for three days and screened for it and couldn't detect any. So that's what, that's kind of like, that's what we do and that's like, so that's what would be like, which is a stronger country concentration. Usually when I'm talking to people about just general bird care and like cleaning their cages and stuff like that with bleach, we do more like a one to 32 concentration where it's much more diluted out and then putting those cages and stuff out in the sun for additional um, UV damage. Um, online there's, there is a product that's set on several sites to be the best available for that. Is it actually tested? Well, is it is it the OxyFresh one or which you know? Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, there's a there's a couple ones that that claim to do it, and I'm not sure that anyone is super well proven to be really awesome at it. And there are some things that are known to do it, but the the human risk of being exposed to the chemicals that can do it is not so good either um, <laughs> as well, and so. That was kind of the, the most convenient one we came up, you know, that we could find that the general population could use. Can 
have you seen an unusual number? Actually, you know, I have not. Yeah, so at our hospital, to be honest, we don't diagnose it too often. Um, and when we do diagnose it, though, it's about 90% lovebirds, um, the occasional cockatoo, um, occasional something else. Um, and then yeah. if you do diagnose it, uh, you're taking precautions before seeing lovebirds? Yeah, well, so that's where, if, if, even if I don't know it had it, but I suspect it did, those are the ones where we bleach down the room and, uh, and then we see the birds in another room for a couple days while we keep cleaning that room. Um, and Right, right, yeah. And that's, you know, that's just, that's how we do it, how some of the other hospitals do it. Um, you know, so that's, that's, you know, there's, there's not much better you can do than that, really, because we still have to see sick birds. What, what about the bathing the bird? Bathing like a positive bird or? Okay, so, so bathing, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's still okay to bathe the birds that have it. Um, it's just, if you have a bird that has it, then your environment has it, your home has it, so you shouldn't be bringing any other new birds into that environment, but you can still care for them like a normal bird. So it's okay to bathe them, you want them on a good diet. If they get sick, then you need to get them on, you know, medications um, kind of stuff. For regular birds, um, you, you can just, you, they don't generally get, it's, it's not something would, they would get from bathing. They would have to be getting it from, you know, close contact with a, a, a bird that has it. Oh, all like the shampoos and those kind of things. Uh, so, I mean, generally we just do water. You know, I, I'm not, I don't like to put on a whole lot of other things onto the birds. Um, I, so when, I do, when we do the baths, we just let them mist with water. Cause they, and there's not something you could put on them that would prevent them from being exposed. Yeah, I would be more worried that I would irritate the bird than help the bird with that. Um, and with doesn't bother her. All right. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> he's green. So um, yeah. So none of that, none of those products for humans has been tested on birds. And, um, I don't know how to really test the bird products. So. Yeah, that's why we just go with water for the most part. And I also, I always worry too that I don't want to irritate their skin, irritate their eyes, or damage their ability to um, preen their feathers properly. You know, and so some of the, um, if you have stuff that has a lot of decreasing activity, it can break down some of the waterproofing oils and stuff that they're putting on themselves and stuff too. Yep. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, that's another one that we talk about a lot. The biggest fear of that one, so that one actually the government does get involved in because psittacosis can be given to people too. Um, and what that is for those of you that aren't, aren't real aware is it's another one of these, um, this one's actually a bacteria. Uh, in people, it can cause chronic respiratory problems, uh, chronic lung problems, uh, well, that's kind of redundant, but um, heart problems and that kind of stuff and fevers. In birds, it can be anywhere from the bird is totally non-clinical and is shedding it to their um, getting the same kind of signs, upper respiratory infections, chronic respiratory infections that also can affect their liver, uh, cause liver infections in the birds. Some birds get just super sick and die really quickly from it too. Uh, it's something that we screen because it has the zoonotic potential, meaning it can go to people. We screen all birds that board at our facility for it. Um, and on those screenings, we've actually never had a bird come up positive. We've had a couple sick ones come up positive over the years, but really I can only think of, it's less than, less than five, maybe even less than three in the 15 years we've been doing it. And we test somewhat regular, pretty regularly for it. The only reason I asked is the last week, one of our members said he had a couple of friends that said, and they were talking about that parrot. Uh huh. Ha, huh, that's uncommon. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, it is, it is something if you do have respiratory symptoms and that kind of stuff to let your doctor know. We don't see it very often, but it, it does happen. Yeah. Okay, is that all the questions? Um, Nadine has got a lovely poem for Dr. Walsh. It's called The Very Best Bet Yet. No matter what kind of critter you have as a pet, you want the very best care you can get. Rather than worry, stew, and fret, don't bother searching the internet. 
Don't jump on a jet and go into debt. We all can attest right here on Oahu is the very best, most talented vet. He's the nicest, kindest doctor you've ever met. Don't sweat until you're soaking wet or be upset because Dr. Walsh is the best, most qualified vet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if the birds were a green or just a green. <laughs> it's my job to bring you a lay, and I totally... Oh, so that's sorry. fine. <laughs> so we'll pretend like we're laying. <laughs> here, here, here. We have a gift for you. Oh. Um, as you all know, uh, Dr. Walsh was very helpful with us uh, with the 12 Bloom Gold Macaws, and we really appreciate oh, it. Oh, This is nice. just a token of our appreciation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, we'll put that up at our hospital. Mm, okay. Yeah. Oh, Thank you very much. And, uh, Jeff... <laughs> Yeah, it's got a video here. Oh, cool.